remind you that you are still under oath. Okay, I know. So I'd like to move to the topic of what happened to Mr. O.J. Jallo. The commission heard testimony from Mr. Jallo himself saying that you're one of the individuals who participated in, um, in torturing him at Fajara Barracks in October 1995. Can you please tell the commission how you came to be involved in that incident? Okay. I'm um, actually, like I said earlier on, I work uh, that time uh, also still with the Gambia National Army Training School, <coughs> uh, which was, of course, um, co-located in Fajara Barracks. And at the training school, we don't have an armory of our own. We keep the weapons of the training school with the Fajara Barracks main armory. And uh, time and again, um, we do go to the armory from the we do go to the armory from the training school uh, to send out weapons to send out our personal weapons from there, or to send out any equipment we need from the um, Fajara Barracks. So it's just a walking distance, maybe 12, 13 minutes, 15, 14 minutes from the school to the Fajara Barracks um, Amori. So occasionally uh, we march from the school or you walk individually on your own to go to Fajara Barracks and then collect your weapon, go back to the school. When you finish the function or the duty with the weapon, Again, you walk to Fajara Barracks and return your weapon. This was our routine at the training school. It was one of our routines at the training school. So actually, the issue uh, with Uncle O.J. Jalo um, happened when one day uh, we were going to the armory to collect our weapons. And I was also going to the armory to collect my weapon. Then upon reaching uh, the area of the armory, which is very close to the main gate, I saw some vehicles, pickups with a uh, truck, and they were bringing some detainees. Already that time, there were other people who were detained there, but when I come to the armory going home, as I am passing, I used to see them uh, on the sides, you know, sitting there. Uh, or some of them standing there with some other soldiers. Uh, on this occasion, uh, once I arrived there, these vehicles were also coming and bringing some detainees. So among uh, the group, I saw Almamo Mane. I think he was uh, among the main people who were escorting these guys to the Fajara barracks. And Almamo, I happen to know him. He comes from the North Bank, Sitanunku, North Bank region. I come from Bunyadu, uh, North Bank region. When he was going to school, like many other students in the cluster villages, because our village was close to Berending, they bring their students to stay in our village. There were a lot of, lot of students from cluster villages almost the size of the uh, boys of our village. Uh, Almamo uh, was elder than me. He was contemporary to my eldest brother, uh, Aliuba. He also passed away, my eldest brother. So they used to move. And you know, at our home in Bunyado, if you know, my father used to have cows that time he was alive. And at our home, there is no time, time for breakfast, there is no time for lunch, there is no time for dinner. Any time you come to our house, you will eat milk and then what we call jere. So most of the students, you know, Almamo was 
moving with my brother, pro some other guys because they are age groups. And most of the students used to come to our home to have food there. Uh, my mom was very generous to everybody. In fact, when we used to have a guest in the village, the guests will go to the Alcalo's home. They will go to, they will tell, go to Pa Usman's compound. So we, we used to have guests every time. And these students also used to come. So that mingling with my brother and then myself, I was young that time, also going to school. I think I was in primary five or six. And Almamo was in the senior school in Berending. I happened to know him, and we used to chat. They used to send us with my brother. So I knew him from that time. Uh, eventually, when he uh, finished school, then he enrolled in the army. When I also finally finished the school, I also um, uh, enrolled in the force. So this was a person that I value as much as I valued my own brother, Sam, more than father. And when I happened to join the army also, you know, I used to take advices from him. If I have things that doubt me, I used to ask him because he was my senior. He was my senior as well. So even though we were not at the same unit, but we were very close. And occasionally we used to meet our, at our village uh, programs. So when I saw him, uh, when they were channeling these detainees to those uh, where they kept them, those uh, hangars. If you, maybe the commission one day, they will go to Fajara Barracks to see for themselves. Uh, you have uh, the Amori, then when you pass the Amori a little bit on the left, uh, you have two hangars. The other one, uh, they are both vehicle hangars. The other one is a bigger hangar, and the other one is where, you know, the, that the vehicles that are ready for use in the morning or the ones that have problem to maintenance, they keep them there. The other one, the, the spare parts, the other big hunger, the spare parts and other vehicles that are not needed are usually kept there. So whilst they were channeling these detainees there, then, you know, Almamo had already seen me. So then um, he waved at me and then he, he called me. So then I, I, after a while, I went to the Amor, I said, okay, I, I will, I will, I will uh, come, I will, I will, the Amor, I will come and sign my rifle, but I'm coming. So I went uh, there. So when I went there, <coughs> then I saw Almamo, and Almamo pointed, he said, do you know these people? I said, um, I have recognized, especially one, I think um, Oye was the most fair colored uh, uh, among them. And also because he was a minister, a famous minister in the government, you know, um, I, I recognize him. I've seen him in newspapers I read, you know. So I, I recognize. And then he told me that, you know, you see this guy especially pointing to OJ. He said, if there would be any problem in this country. The guy who wants to spoil this country is this guy. And then he started <coughs> and then um, he started uh, to explain to me that you know, OJ is uh, you know, conniving with the Europeans. You know, that time there was sanction embargo against the Gambia. You know, and then, you know, he's working, highly working on modalities to bring mercenaries into the Gambia. And then they will overthrow the new government and then they will spoil the revolution. And in the process, the mercenaries who are merciless, they will end up also killing all of us. And this is the man, this is the main man who is doing that, despite the fact that he has been warned again and again. You know, he's the one doing this thing. You know, and their plans are almost almost ripe. You know, a lot of other things. So once he said that, of course, that time I was I was young. I was in my twenties, and the fact that I knew him, and the fact that many times I have confided with him, with issues regarding you know some advices, personal advices, and advices about the job. You know. 
explaining those things and then pointing, telling that this, he is the main problem, you know, who want to mix this country and, and want, you know, us to kill, to be killed when the machineries come to create mayhem and then in that, you know, the Gambians will suffer, our families will suffer and on and on, things like that. So, uh, definitely also around that time, because of my age and my level of maturity that time, really I was very gullible and I believed in him. And then that is what <coughs> led me to, you know, uh, join in, you know, in, in, in torturing uh, Uncle Oje. Can you tell us what you did to Uncle Oje, as you call him? Uh, when Almamo said that, and I came along with Almamo, Ad then they have isolated. Um, few of them were isolated. I think about three or four of them were isolated, and they were already they were already instructed to undress. You know, then I came close to Oje, and Almamo himself hit him. You know, when I came close to him. You know, as I was coming close to him, thinking of what Almamo has told me, you know, I was really angry. Why should this guy think like that? You know, he had been in government for so long, you know, these people just came in, you know, we are transitioning. Why should he think in that line? You know? So as I came close to him, you know, I punched him on the stomach. You know, I hit him on the stomach. Then he bent down. You know, and then I started, you know, beating him with my hands, you know. So suddenly, you know, because Fajara Barracks was the, was the headquarters of the gendarmerie, then when I look around, I was not satisfied with hitting and kicking him with my hands and my, my feet. Uh, I saw that, you know, these uh, truncheons that were being used by the gendarmes, uh, for some reason, I don't know, they were littered around, you know. So I reached out for a good one. Take your time, Captain Ba. Um, just take your time and tell your story. Yes, I want to continue. So, as I said, very regrettable. Then I reached out for, for that one, you know, and I, I, I was hitting him, you know, mercilessly on, on almost all parts of his body, his head especially, you know, and then, then the, the, the feet and the body, you know, I was hitting him there, you know, and then he fall down, you know, then, you know, I, I kick him also, you know, and I was hitting him, you know. So uh, this lasted for, for a while. Um, you know, I, particularly me, I was concentrating on him for what is told about him, you know. So I was, I was hitting him, I was beating him. Uh, of course, <sighs> like, Every reasonable man should be able to think. Um, that time, the maturity was also not there. I was in my 20s because God says that, you know, God tells us, God reminds us in the Quran that, and I I may, if I may quote, that, Ya Yuhallazina Amanu in Jaakun Fasikun Binaba in Fatabayanu. When an evil monger or a perverted transgressor comes to you with any news. The scholars, they know the verse that I'm quoting. Um, Allah said, verify it. Fatabayanu, verify it. Because as a human being, Allah has given you the mind, and then it is your responsibility to use the mind. But also looking at the situation that time, I was very young. This is a guy that I have trusted. I knew him well when I was in primary school at our village. You know, and I trusted him also. 
you know, he go give those information, the circumstances that time as well. You know, so I was very naive, definitely. And I don't have anybody but to blame myself because it is my duty as instructed by, to, by God to verify uh, whether it is true. And even if it was true, also I think the, the most reasonable thing I should have done was just to offer him some advice not to go into that, you know, because when the conflict comes, uh, nobody who knows who is going to die and who is going to survive. So um, several occasions, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I think three or more occasions, uh, and I have been definitely, to be quite honest, truthfully, I have been involved in, in beating him, you know. And after that, you know, um, later it emerged that, you know, all these allegations were not true. So I really regretted, I really regretted why it's un inconceivable why should just uh, an information be given and then without verifying and then you go into, you know, beating the person like that. Um, in my mind, I accepted guilt in my mind and really since then, after that, I regretted it. Anytime I read paper and I show the story of OJ on the paper, I feel very guilty to myself and I feel very bad. Anytime I saw him, for example, on television, you know, I feel so bad. Anytime I think about it as well, uh, I feel so bad. And after the, the issues of the OJs, definitely from then on, I have, even though, even though I have, ha I have had the opportunity to do some extreme things, I had the opportunity, you know, but after that, I have never involved in anything whatsoever like uh, torturing people and killing people. Even though at some points uh, in, in the history of our country, everybody knows these were things that were frequent. But Alhamdulillah, with the protection of God since, since after that, this thing, because this thing keeps on ringing in my mind continuously. You know, I, I feel guilty and I feel that I have offended him. And ever since, I have been thinking of apologizing him. And some people may wonder in their minds, why since that time, 22 years on now, why this guy has never taken the attempt to apologize? Uh, my reasons, this was singing in my mind every single day, every single time, especially when the issue of uh, Uncle Oje is mentioned. But then um, the reasons why I couldn't face him to apologize him that time were two reasons. One is that uh, the person under whose rule these things happened was still the president of the Republic of the country that time. And when you go to apologize, one, you don't know how he is, uh, one, you don't know how the person you are apologizing is going to react, one. Number two also, you don't know how also, uh, under whose watch you did this thing also is, is going to react. And for that reason, uh, ever since I have not been uh, able to apologize to Uncle OJ, although this guilt has since then been with me, and as he mentioned in the Truth Commission, I watched it myself in the evening at my house. Uh, what he said about me is true, and I want to accept the responsibility. I should not hide to accept the responsibility, because if I do that, also Allah will account for me. But I feel that if I come out and then tell the truth, and possibly apologize him, maybe with Allah's um, will, he may be able to accept. Even before I was called uh, to the commission, my brother is here, Usman. He's sitting at the corner. I did call him. The whole of my family, I have never confessed to anyone that I have done this, never. But Osman, we are very close. I have told him about it. And then I have told him, please, to help me 
I am willing to face Uncle OJ and apologize to him personally. If at all, it will not be any problem with him. Uh, I said to my brother Usman, I said, I am a human being. All human beings, one way or the other, knowingly or unknowingly, we, we, we have offended people. And when you are young, you are not very formalized. Because after the OJ, OJ's incident, uh, I applied for this law program to the GTTI. And from 1996 to 1998, I was studying law at the, the Gambia Tra Technical Training Institute. And subsequent to that, uh, from 2000 to 2001, I was also studying uh, the diploma in management at the Management Development Institute. You know, I was trying to build my knowledge and also build my experience because this is a mistake that has happened to me and I don't want the mistake to happen to me again. So even before I was called to this commission, Wallahi, Allah knows what is in the heart of everybody. I was already working on the modalities. Usman is here, he can prove me if I'm lying, let him tell the commission I'm lying. If I'm telling the truth, also let him tell the commission that I'm telling the truth. But I have been already working on the modalities because when I last asked, he told me that o uh, Uncle OJ has gone to Nigeria on this election observing. And that is why we did not actualize our movement to go and apologize to him. Um, I want to accept that I am guilty. What I have done is wrong. I have offended him. I have offended the people of the country because I'm a soldier. I'm supposed to protect the people of the country. And I have also offended my family for them, after them knowing now that you know our brother, our father can do this type of thing is really um, very tormenting internally. So I will, I have accepted guilt 100% and I regret definitely why I have done this. What was going on in my mind to do th this type of things. And I will uh, urge the indulgence of the commission which are here to establish the truth of what happened from July 1994 to January 2016. I will urge their indulgence to try to show me the way and to help to make sure that I apologize to Uncle OJ and I atone, atone for this sinful thing that I did. <clears throat> what I want to say beyond that is that down the pages of history, I myself have been victim twice, uh, namely 2012. I was locked up in the NIA with, with all my guards at the, at the Fajara Barracks. And in 2012 also, during the political impasse, I was missing also. So I have also been a victim. But that does not justify me to treat anybody in a wrong way. So I want to say I'm sorry to the people of the country. I want to say that I'm sorry to Uncle OJ, I want to say that I am sorry uh, to everybody in this country, whether they are Gambians or they are not Gambians. <clears throat> I know the armed forces is the protector of the people, and you know I should have, uh, have found myself, uh, you know, in in protecting the people of the country. But like I said, I was young and crazy. So, inevitably, this is uh, definitely what happened. Thank you very much for that, Captain Ba. When the investigators of the TRRC contacted you, you immediately accepted responsibility and said that you would apologize publicly to Mr. OJ Jalo, his family, as well as the Gambian people. And that's what you've done right now. But I just wanted to ask you if there's anything that you would directly want to say to Mr. Ojay Jalo and his family. Uh, wallahi, I will not sleep comfortably. 
until and unless I face Uncle OJ and I apologize to him to tell him that what happened around October 1995 when they were detained in Fajala Barracks. My part, I want to definitely, you know, apologize to him personally to tell that uh, I have treated you in a wrong way. I have accepted the guilt. I have accepted the responsibility. And I'm not perfect as a human being. I will kindly request that you and your family, the pain I have inflicted on you, by extension, the pain I have also inflicted on your family. I want you, for the sake of God, Uncle Oje Jalo, for the sake of Allah, to please, please forgive me for what I have done to you. Thank you, Captain Ba. As we've already indicated to you, the commission, an important aspect of the commission's mandate is to promote reconciliation and healing. And in that regard, you have expressed your willingness to participate in reconciliation efforts, and the commission will facilitate that um, as a way of moving forward and forging ahead. I would like to ask one last question on this matter before we move on to your victimization, and that's in relation to the issue of amnesty. Is that something that you are willing to apply for before the commission? <coughs> indeed, indeed I am willing to, I'm willing to apply. Uh, this is why I came here and then tell the truth. Even if this commission was not in the Gambia, even if it was somewhere else, I would not have hesitated even a second to contact them and then uh, tell things exactly the way they happen, what I know, and I'll also to explain my role. So um, this is unfortunate. I don't know how my family is thinking about me now. You know, uh, I don't know the people of the country also looking this life on what are they thinking about uh, about me? But uh, I just want to uh, say that we are human beings. We are not perfect. Sometimes, you know, when you are misguided and, you know, Satan is involved, uh, you may do things that uh, ordinarily you would not you would not have done so um still now it's my fault and you know i think um like they say the wise person learn from his mistakes but the wisest learn from the mistake of others uh, i have learned i am learning from my own mistake and since this is, this is aired, you know, the wisest people who are not me, they should learn the mistake from others that is my mistake. So I don't even know what to say again. You know, my, my heart is heavy. Uh, I am really sorry, really. I am sorry, definitely. It's my fault, I'm sorry, really. I'm sorry to everybody. I'm sorry to these members of this hall. I'm sorry to every person in the in the in the country. I'm I'm I'm, I'm saying sorry. Um, first and foremost, I'm saying sorry to Uncle OJ and his family. First and foremost. Then after that, also I I want to apologize to everyone uh, who um, uh, my action has uh, uh, who feel disappointed. With, with my actions. Um, I am a human being. I have made the mistake. The only thing I can ask for is to apologize 
If I was able to correct the mistake, I would have corrected it. But I don't have the powers. Uh, the only thing I can say is that um, I'm sorry for the sake of God. Please forgive me. I apologize. Since after that, such things have never happened. And inshallah, it will never happen. Thank you very much for coming to tell us the truth and for the courage you've shown in publicly acknowledging what you've done. I want to now move on to your own victimization. You told us that you were first arrested in 2012. Can you tell us about that incident? Um, like I said, um, um, from the training school, I was posted to Yundum. Then subsequently, after some time, I was posted to Fajara Barracks. And in 2012, uh, um, um, I was in Fajara Barracks before I was uh, promoted to captain. So I was on duties, actually, because usually there are soldiers on duty at the camp, and there is also always the duty officer. So I was the duty officer of the camp on that day. I think it was on a, on a Wednesday. And I closed on, I was supposed to close on Thursday morning. Uh, but that Wednesday, the children, the soldier children in the camp, I think they, they pick a small a ram you know, uh, um, somewhere in the camp. And they were moving around with this, with this, with this ram. Uh, subsequently, um, it died in their hands. So when it died in their hands, actually they, are, they were moving in the camp to find out who owned the ram. Then subsequently, it died in their hand. And children being children, uh, there is a field in Fajara Barracks. When you go, there is a big field at the middle. That's the that, that's where they do the drill training and other trainings. So these children took this dead ram. There is also a dump site just around there. Normally, it's a temporal dump site. It is always being cleared. People throw the clothes, you know, bad clothes, mosquito nets. So these children mingling around with this dead ram. They went there and they saw. Um, I think some guys might have disposed of their, you know, this bed seat, white bed seat, or mosquito net. So these children in group, you know, they, they cut part of that mosquito net and the blanket, and they took this dead lamb and they shrouded it into that cloth, like the way you shroud, a, you, the way you cover a dead body. So they went to the field. It, they frequently play in the field. If you, are, if you know about Fajarabaras, the children, they play in the field. They run on the assault course there. They play there. Sometimes we even chase them away. But they are military children, stubborn. What they see the elders doing, that, that's what they also do, you know. That's how they act. <coughs> so for, for some unknown reasons, they took this and shrouded, and then they took it into the middle of the field, and they formed ranks behind they pray it like they are praying janaza. When they pray janaza or over it, they finish. You know, because the field is also frequented by dogs, and they normally dogs, you know, when they frequent places, they dog out places. Just for people who don't know, when you say janaza, um, can you explain what you're referring to? Yeah, just like how you pray the dead body. When you cover it and then put it in a coffin and put it, then you make ranks and then you pray, just how they pray on dead body. And just to clarify one more thing, when you refer to military children or soldier children, you're referring to the children of the soldiers stationed at Fajara Barracks, is that correct? Yes, the sons and daughters of the soldiers and, and officers um, staying in the Fajara Barracks. Thank you for that clarification, please proceed. So when the children, you know, pray the janaza over this uh, dead ram, 
they, they pick it after that, they, they put it in one of the holes there that was dug out. And then they bury it there. Then they, they scattered. I think that night there was a heavy rainfall that evening. There was a heavy rainfall. So I was on duties. When the subsequent day when I closed from duty, usually when you close from duty, after, clo after working hours, you go home. So after working hours, I went home. Then I think when these things start decomposing, the dogs smell it, they dug it out. The recruits at the training school, when they tap, when they are tap close, because the pressure around there is low, they used to proceed to Fajara Barracks. We have a water hydrant. They will come and fetch water from there and go back to the training school with their buckets in bulk, in numbers. So I think while they were going back, they noticed that this thing has been dug out by the dogs. And I don't know how, how that information was peddled until it reached Banjul. And the info, information arrived that you know this dead drum was actually operated on and they have put a juju in it, they shrouded it, and it was buried at the Fajara barracks. At uh, that time, Lieutenant Colonel Seni Bayo was my commanding officer. Um, after that time, I'll come to that. He was dismissed and he went to America. Now, recently, he's back. He's our CO, commanding officer in Farafenye. Eh, Astaghfirullah. He is our commanding officer in Base. So, when this thing happened, this thing was discovered. You know, calls have been made. You know, the IG came, the director of NIA at that time came. I think the deputy chief of defense staff came, or the CDS came. You know, all the, the, the service uh, seniors came to Fajana Barracks. Can you tell us their names? <coughs> uh, the inspector general of police was there, Esa Baji, Jesus. I think uh, the, the deputy chief of defense staff was there, or the army commander, something like that, uh, Yangu Badrame. Uh, he is the deputy chief of defense staff now. I don't know what portfolio he was holding that time. He made maybe army commander or something like that. The director of intelligence also came. If I don't forget, it would have been, uh, I think, Harry Sambo. Harry Sambo. And many senior officers from the state guard also came. So me, I was, I fall out that afternoon and I, when I reach home, you know, then they had already, they had already come to the, to the barracks, you know. I think, according to information, that dead, dead ram was taken to the, even up to the RVH for some medical uh, diagnosis. So when I reached at home, then um, I think they called me, but they couldn't get me. So it was Maghrib time. I just performed a blues, and so I was on the mat and attempting to pray Maghrib. Then my phone rang. So I had not started the prayer. So I said, let me just take my phone. And I took my phone, and I checked. It was a private call. You know, that time, the perception about private call is somebody important there. Nobody is important in, in, the, in the eyes of God. We are all equal. So when I, when I received the call, it was my CEO, Lieutenant Colonel Bio. He said, bah. I said, yes. I said, How, where are you? I said, sir, I'm at home. I was on duties. I fall out, so I'm at home. He said, come back now, now, now. I said, sir, is there any problem? He said, no, just come. But I could hear, I could overheard some talking around, around him, you know. So I knew it was not normal. So I said, no need to further ask what is the problem. So then I just, I said, okay, I'm praying. After that, I'm coming. So I prayed. Then after that, I informed my family that, you know, they have called me to Fajara Barracks. I am going back to Fajara Barracks. So I was not have, I was not driving, so I bought the normal, I boarded the normal vehicles, passenger vehicles. When I reached at Fajara Barracks, I was surprised because all these service chiefs were there. So many officers from State Guard were also there. 
So I approached my CEO, and then I, I saw that they were bulls, bullshitting my CEO. So. What do you mean by that? You know, in the military, we expect that, you know, it's chain of command, we expect um, your subordinates should talk to you in a, in a very disciplined way. In the military, we don't condone that. Your subordinate, even if you were born on the same day or he is, all, he is your father at home, once you are his senior, the, the regimentation take principles. If it is father, he will take instructions from his son. And he should comport himself in a way where, how a junior should comport uh, himself towards the senior. So that respect was not there, the people talking to my, my commanding officer. Virtually, we know that there was no discipline in the end, at, the end, at the end. Your your junior man can report you, and then you can fall in problem. So when I came, they, they also accosted me and then and asked me, what do you know about this thing? Explain. I said, hey, look. I said, I don't know anything about this. I cannot explain anything. What I know is that I was on duties yesterday, and then, then we did our duties with my guards peacefully. And this morning, I closed. I wrote the, the duty officer handing over, and I didn't mention any problem because no problem was reported to me, and I did not notice any problem. And after that, I fall out. That is all I know. I don't know anything about this dead ram issue. I don't know. That time, already, the guys I was uh, on guard with, my guard commander, you know, my uh, sergeant and then the staff sergeant. You know, the other guards were already, already, already also kept there. So my immediate assistant uh, was, um, I think, uh, warrant officer class two, Fasidu Mane. He left now. He is from Katong. That morning, like I went home, he has already, he has also gone home. So they were trying to call him. To, to get him, but his telephone was not on. I think they called Katong to go and arrest him. So then they sat us there, Bio was there, you know, my guard commanders were there. So later uh, we had that, you know, uh, he said he's going to set an example. And when they say set an ex example that time, we just need the clarity. When you say H-E, who are you referring to? Um, obviously, uh, Jamil. Is he known by any other name within your circles? Yeah, they, 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 they give him so many names. You know, SSMI, I think that means tiger, you know, crocodile, you know. Uh, the big man, you know. You know, they give those those type of names. Baba, they, they give those type of names, you know. So, yeah. So they said, uh, he said he's going to set an example. The, the, those in the, in the guard duty, the corporals, should be dismissed with immediate effect. Then the rest, he is going to set an example on them. So that's where we sat until 1 a.m. in the night. Then myself and my guards, we were put into a vehicle to take into the NIA headquarters in Banjul. My CEO bio was not brought. I don't know for what reason. So we were there. I remember vividly that day when we arrived, we slept on the floor at the reception. That's where we slept until morning. We didn't, we didn't even have dinner. Then subsequently, you know, they divide us. You can be going in group, divide, divide, divide. There are a lot of, you know, underground detention places, cells there for investigation. So, you know, they divided us. So later, um, they, they finally put us up in a hall there. They converge us in a hall there. And, you know, they established a panel to investigate about this thing. We spent about three, four days. The fourth day, fourth day, I was the first one to be released. Because my statement was very scanty. I didn't mention anything about that. 
So when they came, uh, you know, they, they told me now you, for you, you are going home, but the rest will stay. And believe me, I didn't even want to go because my, my soldiers were crying. You know, as I was bidding farewell to them, they were crying, you know. But then I, I just tell them that, you know, no problems. This, you know, God is in charge. So just maintain uh, the esprit de corps, the spirit between uh, each others. Inshallah, Allah will, they will release you. Allah, inshallah. So during the days that you spent at the NIA, did anything happen to you during that period? Uh, the others, I don't know, but personally me, nothing happened because they take us one after the other to the investigation panel. But me, uh, really nothing happened because when I came and then they put my statement, my, my statement was maybe a quarter page. So I didn't stay long there and they took me, but everybody had the turn to face the investigation panel. So then I was released when I... Before you continue with the release, you mentioned that at the NIA premises, there are some underground cells. Do you know where those cells are located within the premises? You, you have the building. So normally on the sides of the buildings or in the different rooms, you know, there are so many rooms. You have a, a walkway. And then you have so many, so many rooms. So when they are investigating, they take to different rooms. So there are so many rooms. I went there recently, but then you know they have they have smashed most of the places have been have been smashed down now. Please proceed with um, your release. So uh, the fourth day, I was released very late in the evening. Uh, my brother Abdullah he is here. He is a police officer. When I was released, I went to his house. Then um, we went to the sea. It's common to shower. Then after that, I went home. Um, then I think uh, the following day or the next day, two days later, my other colleagues were also released. My commanding officer, Siani Bayo, was dismissed following that. And that time, the commander of the Republican National Guards was also um, Lieutenant Colonel Biran Sien. Uh, he was also dismissed. Uh, the commander of RNG was dismissed. My own commanding officer was also dismissed. So, but for us, we remain. Did they eventually find out um, what the real story was behind the dead ram? Very well. Uh, actually, what happened was, I think it was the second, third day, in the night, because where we were, you know, you have the window, you can peep through the entrance hall. Suddenly, around 1 o'clock in the night, I saw a, a Ndapa car, this all sides covered car. We use it for this thing, um, distributing um, food. It's covered all around. Uh, it was those vehicles at the TSU, if you would see them. Uh, one of them brought, and uh, I saw little, little children <laughs> jump out of the vehicle. And I recognize that these are our Fajara Barak's children. So down the investigation, they discovered about these children. And I think the children even, they reacted. They reacted the scenario there. So I don't know subsequently when were they taken back, whether they were taken back the same night or whether they were taken back the following day. But as far as I know, roughly around 1 a.m. in the night, uh, the children were brought there. And I recognized they are, you know, Fajara Barak's children. And according, um, they, acted the, they acted the movie there. So just to make sure I understand this correctly, are you saying that around 1 a.m. in the morning, while you were at the NIA, 
premises, the headquarters, children were brought in for questioning. Is that correct? Exactly, around 1 a.m., you know, the children were brought, brought there to the NIA, you know. Okay. You told us that you were arrested a second time. Can you tell us about that incident? That's correct. Um, this was um, uh, during the political impasse. Um, from 2015 to two 2017, I was the deputy commander at the Fajara Barracks. Several people have been commander there, they go, but I, I remain. And um, um, subsequently, you know, in 2016, you know, a very heated um, political campaign here. We all know, then subsequently came the elections. And we play our part to ensure, especially me as the, the two IC, uh, together with my CO, uh, we try to play our part to ensure that since the soldiers are permitted to vote, for them to vote. We had meetings with the IEC, and then we told them that um, uh, come election day, our soldiers will not be able to go and vote where they are registered because the army will be on 100% standby, mean, meaning that everybody will stay put. So we negotiated with, with them to work out modalities to have our soldiers being able to vote. Uh, we highlighted those concerns. They were also reasonable, and they accepted. So what we did wa was we asked all the soldiers to bring along their voting cards. We wrote their name, and we vote, wrote the name of the voter registration number. Then we send the list to the IEC. So in response, what IEC also did was they checked the list and they divided our soldiers to different polling stations around the general area of Fajara, Bakau, and those areas. And then our other soldiers in TSU around the Kololi area. So when it was uh, two days before the election, uh, we had a meeting about um, the, the soldiers, how they will vote. Because already we have taken over a lot of guard posts, like the PIU, the Police Intervention Unit, there are guard posts around here. We were instructed to take over those guard posts. So we have distributed a lot of our soldiers outside. And we want those ones to vote, and we want the one in the camp also to vote. So we arranged some vehicles, and as early as 6 a.m., those are our soldiers in the camp, you know, we put them in vehicles and dispatch them to various polling stations so that they can vote and come back. Those ones that are on duty can also have the chance to vote. We thought that it would be very smooth because already we had discussed with the, with the IEC and we have agreed with the IEC. But unfortunately, at certain polling stations, um, there were some problems because I think the information was not um, translated to some of the polling agents. And when they see a lot of soldiers come to queue, because they were not instructed, they say the uh, soldiers will not vote. Especially the polling station at uh, Newtown, Bakau Newtown Primary School. I had to go there myself, you know, to talk with them. And I remember, I don't know who was there. If I see him, perhaps I will recognize him, the presiding officer. I said, look, allow these people to vote. You know, this is a secret ballot. Where I will vote, you don't know. And I can tell you for sure, after convincing him, I can tell you for sure that there are many among these people who may not, who will not even vote for the for, for Yaya Jame. I said, they are citizens. Just, just please be flexible 
And I said to the guy, I quoted, I said the principle of uh, command in the military, one of the principles of command in the military is flexibility. Command will give you instruction, but as the situation dictates, you, have, you should be flexible with your command. So eventually they vote, we change them and they vote. Then we had deployed so many troops in our AOR because we, um, we have the, the most populous area of responsibility, Fajara Barracks. We are, we are in charge of the KMC. Our boundary with Banjul is Denton Bridge. They are responsible of Banjul. And you know KM is a big uh, municipality it also house all the strategic, um, um, how to call, how, all the strategic assets like banks, you know, and um, communication, this thing, you know, call to power station and all those things. So we deployed a lot of troops. And when we deploy a lot of troops, obviously, if you have not planned very well, you know, where you deploy them, you know, toiletries, shower, bedding, and all those things. You expect to have problems. I was the battalion twice, and obviously operational matters were under my responsibility. So I used to go around every day to check my soldiers, to talk with them, you know, to motivate them, to try to solve their problems, so many problems. And the, 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 the election, the, the vote counting night, 11 o'clock met me in Westfield. Because in Westfield, Westfield is our area of responsibility we have deployed there. The state guards have also deployed there from Banjul. The bulldozers have also deployed there. The paramilitary have also deployed there. So I suggested that this is the, the duplicity of effort. Why not we, we move our guys from there? So then I went back. And then, you know, subsequently, to cut the long story, because this, every, everybody knows, you know, counting of the votes at some point, it stopped. After it continued, at some point, it has a very long lull, and after it stopped. So eventually, it emerged clear that, you know, the, um, the coalition have uh, defeated the incumbent. And then finally the announcement was made. So everybody was like uh, hesitant, you know, what is going to happen. Then suddenly um, we were all relieved because that was, you know, as the Alpha Jodara said, he said, whatever happened, he's a, he's a, he's a musician in, from Guinea. He said, whatever hap is happening is what people talk about. So we were talking about that until eventually he, the, the, he ac the incumbent accepted on television live that he has accepted, you know, and everybody was relieved. You know, a few days after that, there was a U-turn and again the tension mounted again within the army. Orders in, orders on defense, orders against. So we had that situation. Definitely it was a Big tension. A couple with the fact that also we have deployed so many troops outside, you know, um, you know the conditions outside are not suitable, you know. Uh, also, we were also receiving crazy instructions from Banjul. Uh, build fighting positions here, build fighting positions here, build fighting positions here. Haphazard instructions, no clear instructions were given build fighting positions for what, what are the instructions, what are the orders. You know, we were receiving those crazy instructions. Can you tell us a bit more about those instructions? What were some of the locations that you were told to build um, fighting orders? Yeah. Um, virtually all the strategic locations, like in Bakao, around Cape House, we built a fighting position there. Around Cape Point, we built a fighting position there. Around that Cape Point road that goes to Banjul, we established in uh, Bakao around the observer, former observer Johnson, we established a fighting position there, you know. So many places, you know, in almost the, the length and breadth of our KM, you know. So many fighting positions we have brought along the main highways, 
those of the people who were here at that time, they would have seen so many fighting positions that were built. And then we received instructions to deploy, deploy more troops, meaning more problems. Because the soldiers where they, they were deployed, there was no bedding, there was no shower. Even some, so many of them, even the place to go to toilet, they don't have. They have to beg from civilians in, in the neighboring neighborhood to use their toilets. You know, uh, you know, so many problems we were having. Sometimes the tea um, breakfast is not enough. They have miscalculated. Maybe the place have been reinforced. You have more personnel there. Bread is not enough, and things like that. So we were having those complaints every day from the soldiers. Just a couple of questions to clarify some of what you've said already. Although it may be obvious, it still has to come from you. What does KM stand for? You mentioned KM. Uh, Carnifying Municipality. At some point, you mentioned bulldozers. Can you explain to us what you meant by that? Uh, the bulldozers were, bull bulldozers were a, a special unit uh, that was created, and then they were um, headquartered in in Carnifing. In Carnifing, yes, they were given some special instructions. I don't know much about uh, that, but the the unit was there, you know. You mentioned that during that time you were receiving instructions, and the instructions were haphazard. Who were you receiving instructions from? Who was your commander at that time? Uh, my, my CEO, my commanding officer was uh, Colonel Isa Tamba, uh, commonly called Jesus. That's what I was going to ask. Um, please proceed. Yeah, so that, that status quo continued so many problems. We are trying to address the problems going around every two days, sending patrols in the night and having one patrol on standby you know, in case of any eventuality, anywhere to send the patrol there. That was my responsibility. You know, so the problem continued. Uh, alongside that also, we are having casual conversation, you know, with what our co uh, colleague officers. You know, whatever happened, people talk about it. You know, and in me, my opinion, I, I tell my officers, I said, look, the issue is for me personally, I'm not talking about anyone, because now it's like uh, the she now, anyone have to paddle his, his canoe to go. I said to me, my opinion is that I am not going to follow this man. I tell my officers plainly, those that I am very close to. You know, I said, I'm not going to follow this man. He has been here for 22 years. He has been winning election, and we have been rallying behind him. <clears throat> now that the people of the country have decided to vote him out, definitely for me, my conscience tells me that I should follow the will of the people, the choice of the people is my choice. I personally, I'm not going to, I'm not going to follow any other person, but I follow the Gambian people because I'm a Gambian. So casually when we chat, we talk about this, you know. So statu, statu, the status quo remained like that, crazy instructions every now and then, you know. So when I go around, my soldiers are asking me, they say, sir, what are the instructions here? What are we supposed to do here? Because the moment the guy took the youth turn also, they were receiving provocations from people. And you know, the soldier, when he is not experienced, uh, there is possibility of temptation and he can use his weapon. So when I go around, I tell them that, look, you have been deployed here. I know you are not given any instruction, but I said one thing, the instructions to open fire should come from, from me as the operation officer. Not me per se, but from the command. And I am representing the command. You mentioned the crazy instructions. Do you know where those crazy instructions were coming from? Well, I, I was receiving instructions from my commanding officer. Because chain of command requires that you receive uh, instructions from your commanding officer. Unless it is not a normal thing, instructions should flow along the, along the line of chain of command. 
So who was your commanding officer receiving instructions from? Um, my commanding officer and my unit um, were under the RNG, Republican National Guards, that had two battalions that time. The State Guard Battalion in Banjul, the Guards Battalion in Fajara Barak. So we were all under the umbrella of the commander of Republican National Guards, who is none other than General Suleiman Baji. So I assume that the instructions would have been coming from him, uh, wherever they may come from. And still based on the chain of command, from what you know, where would um, General Saul Baji have received his instructions from? Uh, obviously, General Saul Baji, um, he was very powerful. Actually, he was the one running the show. The others were just symbols. This is a fact. As an enlightened officer, you know this thing. Uh, he was the one running the show. And I assume that, of course, he is taking the instructions from Yahya Jame directly, who is the commander-in-chief that time of the Gambia Armed Forces. Thank you for that clarification. Please continue. So like I said, these crazy instructions continued. And I went around and I told my soldiers that the order to open fire should only come from me. Even if you are provoked, you are pelted with stones, do not respond with fire. So the order to open fire, the instruction should come only from, from us. So um, I was, as I said, I was going around, around every two days. So uh, we were given instructions to establish a fighting position around the Tipagaras. You know, Tipa Garage is a crowded area. They had established a fighting position somewhere, you know, and there are a lot of, you know, the civilian population close to that. So whilst I was going round, I went to that place and I saw the place. Then, you know, I felt that it is this fighting position is not suitable here. I look around, I saw Bakote Police Station is like a semi-story building. So I went there and I went up and I checked that is a very suitable place. The view is okay. You can establish a fighting position there and then you can control the whole area. So I decided to transfer the fighting position on top of the, the police building. And now I post my people there to operate with the police and I have to talk to both of them because they are operating together. And I said to them, I said, look, even though you are putting on dif uh, different uniforms, the security services of the Gambia are one. Somebody is like all of us together, order putting on half tan, order putting on shoot, order putting on over other clothes, but we are one. So operate together, respect each other, respond to any threat together. So I address them nicely. Then um, I went. Then I used to go to Bakau, then go along the Kairaba, visit all our positions around Bakau area. Our boundary with Yundu was the GNPC petrol station in Abuko. I had also established a fighting position there. So um, one evening, uh, again, I was going around just to check what my soldiers, how, what, how they, what their conditions are. So I went around. Uh, check all the places. Then, whilst I was in the car going around the Latrikunda market, that uh, evening, no, sorry, a, a day before that again, I went around and again I, I went to the Bakote station. Uh, uh, I think three days before, two days before, that, three days before that. So, at, whilst I was at the Bakote station, um, then I received a call. It was a private number, and then I picked the call, and it happened to be General Suleiman Baji. Uh, we greeted. He said, where are you? Are you at the camp? I said, no, I'm not at the camp. I said, I'm going around, so we have too many problems. I'm going around now. I am at Barcote Station. Because I pray Makrib at the petroleum building. Then from there, I went to Bakota. He said, okay, I am also coming from around Sukuta. 
I said, sir, but there are too many problems. He said, okay, now uh, let's meet at the uh, Barcote dump site. He said, are you with, with escort? I said, yes, I'm with escort. He said, I, for me, I'm not with escort. So can we meet around the Barcote dump site? But leave your escort behind. I said, okay. So I said, where? He said, when you take that Barcote the, around the SOS, before you reach that Barcote clinic, you will see two Africell tabla, one on the left, one on the right, and there's a red container behind one of the Afri Africell tabla. Let's meet around there. I said, okay. So I left my guys there. Then I, I tell I'm coming. I drove the car and I went and I parked behind that container. I closed my, uh, the, the, the doors of my vehicle. I came down from the car and I took cover behind that container. You know, you have the back of the dump side. Also calculating what has this guy called me for. If I told he is with his escort, then I will just, I will, not, I will just submerge, I will sink, I will, I will disappear in, in, the, in, the, in the, this thing, in, inside the, uh, the back of the dump side. He would not see me. But if I told he is alone, uh, this is one on one. If there is any threat, then who dares win? Uh, so suddenly I was there after 15, 17 minutes. Uh, I saw a black car coming from around ahead, uh, um, around uh, the back of the high school area on the highway, this big black car. So immediately I suspected that it must be him. He came, and I, I'm sure he must have passed my car. He must have seen my car, so he passed. When I don't see the escort following him, the moment he passed, I opened the car, I entered, and I sat there. After a while, he turned back. Then he came until he passed me. He passed the average tabla on the opposite side. He also branched there. So I came down from the vehicle, and then I went to meet him. Uh, when I went to meet him, and he, the moment I arrived, he opened the door. It was very cold inside. The AC is running. Uh, he was having his weapon uh, at the, around the gear. Uh, I was having my cocked pistol under my, under, my, under my armpit. So I entered, I sit down, and then we greeted. So when we greeted, um, he started narrating stories. He said, look, you know, do you know what happened about this election? I said, no, <laughs> what happened is clear. He said, look, do you know that these people have played a very big mafia game? Our guys in the diaspora have contributed huge amount of money, and they bribed these guys at the IEC to turn the results against the president. And, you know, also, you know, we had a lot of dissidents outside. Those ones are based in Senegal, and the Senegalese government is also... A, helping them in planning, you know, to, to, to give them arms, and they have also got machineries, and equally also they are conniving with some members of the armed forces, you know, to come and make sure that they attack the country. And there is this threat also from ECOWAS. And you know, look, bah, I know you a long time. We did courses together, VIP training and other courses together. I know you are a very professional man. So we are counting on people like you to make sure that that doesn't happen. To do whatever it takes to make sure that that doesn't happen. You know, so he told me those things and, you know, so many things, bad guys, you know, the West is backing those people, you know, things like that. And then finally he said to me, you know, uh, look, uh, he said, um, there is this tax, you know, uh, because now, you know, they wanted to create the impression that these people, even though things went like this, you know, they want to tell, show the international community that these people, you know, are not fit, you know, even to, to rule this country. So they are bent on violence and vengeance and revenge. So he um, uh, gave me a tax that I should, he gave me some targets that I should 
plant explosives there and I should explode those targets and then we, they will put the blame on them. Uh, they will promote me to the rank I want and then they will also look after my welfare. Uh, they will give me money as much I, as I want. So when he said that, I kept quiet. I was in the car, I kept quiet for almost two, three minutes. He said, is there any problem? I said, no, there is no problem. I said, I am calculating. I said, yes, because he mentioned about what happened in 1981 when they invaded the country, the Senegalese invaded the country. I said, yes. I said, but this time around also, 1981, it was the turn of orders to protect this country. N uh, 2016, this is the time that we are also found in the army. And you know, I was talking to him in a mature way. It is our responsibility to make sure that we protect this country. Whether we do it is our responsibility. Whether we don't do it, it is our responsibility. And we will make sure that this country, we will defend it and then protect the territorial integrity and protect the people and the properties of the country. Seemingly trying to agree with him, seemingly. So um, the targets he mentioned is the, the GMPC petrol stations to, 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 to bomb, to explode them, to plant explosives and, and explode them. So I told him, yes, I can do it. I said, but you know, this is uh, a difficult, it's a simple tax, but it's also a difficult tax. Because you have said that, you know, there are some, you know, members of the fifth column, you know, enemies within us who are conniving with our dissidents and we don't know who is who. So you also need to give me time like the way you trust me also to scout out people that I trust to help me actualize this thing. He said, okay. He said, but please, very soon. So you call, make sure you call me at least before two days, call me. I said, okay, I will call you. He said, otherwise, uh, are there any problems? I said, yeah, there are so many problems. And I explained these problems I mentioned, you know, the soldiers, you know, accommodation is a problem, toiletry and all those, those things. So then after that, I complimented him and I get down the car, get off the car. When I get off the car, I move few steps, he called me. I came, he lowered the mirror, the this thing, the door, door glass, and then he gave me 10,000. I said, what? He said, um, you know, we are on 100% standby. You can buy credit and, and other things from this, okay? But don't worry, your welfare will be taken care of. I said, okay. So when he lowered the glass, as I, uh, the uh, door, this thing, when I came down, when I went back, you know, as I face, you know, I'm able to see behind and I could see some, some money bags inside the car. Some money bags. I could see some money bags inside the car piled together in the behind. So then after that, I left. Before you proceed, you mentioned that one of the things that Saul Baji said to you was, these people are bent on revenge or vengeance. Which people was he referring? Which people were he? Uh, I assume that time he is talking about the coalition that have won the election because there was no logic for other people to do. I assume he was talking because he talked about the, the rigging of the election uh, against them, and then he spoke about this. So I assume that time he is referring to the coalition, really, reasonably. Please proceed. Um, so from there, I went back to Barcote Station, you know, then with my escort. With my escort, uh, we, I drove back to Fajara Barracks. I drove back to Fajara Barracks. Uh, I didn't call him, really. The following day, I didn't call him. The, sec the second day after that, I didn't call him. Then the third day, the third day, uh, my commanding officer told me, my commanding officer told me that in the morning, he told me that uh, Commander RNG is coming to visit the camp today, this morning. I said, okay. I said, let me just contact because when a general is coming to the camp, you organize what they call quarter guard ceremony, small ceremony to receive him. I said, then let me tell the RSM to organize quarter guard before he arrives. And then the guy said, uh, my, my commanding officer told me that he said there is no need for a quarter guard. This is just a family visit. And this is unusual. 
a general officially coming to the camp, you should they should organize quarter guard for you. So then, being the um, uh, battalion twice, I we arrange chairs and we fall in all the soldiers uh, to sit there. So I remain with them. My commander and few officers went to the gate to receive Saul Bajin. So eventually, finally, he came. Then when he came, they walked with him from the gate. Then I raised the battalion, and then I salute. I give him the figo, and then you know I seek permission to sit them down. He said, okay. And you know, when they sat down, he narrated verbatim the same thing he told me when I met with him one-on-one. -on -one. He narrated exactly the same thing. Except the instruction he gave to me. So in my mind, I was calculating that I, because perhaps he didn't hear from me, that is why he came for the visit. When you say everything except the instructions he gave you, which specific instructions are you referring to? Uh, the instruction about those targets to destroy. You said that um, he mentioned GNPC. Were other targets mentioned as well? Uh, he mentioned specifically the GNPC petrol stations. And later, you know, information came that uh, some guys want to sabotage to bomb the GMPCs, to destroy, to burn the GMPC stations. It was the GMPC stations. He, meant he mentioned petroleum house, but later he changed the instruction. Yeah, but it was mainly the GMPC stations. So after he gave the same instruction, uh, he relayed the same information to the soldiers, excluding the specific instruction he gave you regarding the explosives. What, what else happened? Um, then he gave some money to the officers. I think 20000 if I don't forget. He gave some money to the officers. Uh, there was money in his car. Uh, he gave uh, 20000 to the officers, and he also gave, I think, some money also. Whether it's 30000 or 40000 I don't know precisely. I don't remember precisely. Also, he gave to the troops. Then after that, when he said he was going, uh, you know, the officers, we saw him off to the car. We, take him along, you know, carried him beside the car. So when he was about to enter the car, I salute him. I said, sir, I said, with the threats you are talking about against the country, against Gambia, you know, uh, considering that, that in Fajara barracks, we don't have weapons. Our guys are on standby, roughly almost about 800 to 900 soldiers on standby. And even half of those people were not armed. So what mechanisms are there to make sure that we defend our camp and we defend the country in case if there is any problem? What mechanism, mechanisms are there? Because I know for a fact, I know for a fact from my training experience, from my professional experience, I know for a fact that for, a, for an army to fight a battle, they need at least six months preparation, if not one year. Because, you know, you need to study the ground, you need to study the avenue of approach, you need to zero your heavy weapons to zero them on the avenues of approach. The logistic connections, you need to work out all those things. I know it should take at least six months to prepare to counter an enemy that is attacking your army. So I was somehow asking this question, but at the same time also trying to ridicule, ridiculing him. That what mechanisms are there We, we have empty hands? He said, but don't worry. We have more than enough weapons. But right now, as things are, we must know who is who first. And then after that, he looked at my rank. He said, oh, you are still a captain. I said, yes. He said, he asked my commanding officer. He said, but why is this guy not promoted? And that guy told him, ah, me, I don't know. So then he, w he entered his car, and then he went. If I can just stop you there temporarily. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm seeking guidance because we only have a few m more minutes um, in order to conclude the testimony. I think roughly 15 minutes um, beyond time. So I would propose, if that's agreeable to the commissioners, to continue um, for another 15 minutes and then end the testimony and um, then we're done for today. 
Thank you, Council. You may proceed accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, please proceed with, uh, with your testimony, Captain Ba. So we saw him off and he went away. He went. So we returned back to our routine. I returned back to my routine, going around to check on my troops. And I think when he came, the, that day I didn't go out, but the following day I went out, or the second day I went out again, all around, around all our positions, all our deployments. So again, you know, I used to go this way and then come back this way. I used to go by the Kairaba Avenue after finishing Bakawa. I used to go via the Kairaba Avenue up to GMPC Abuko, turn back, you know, go to Bundung area, exit around Serekunda, then go to GNPC, uh, so, sorry, go to Petroleum House, then from there come to Backwater Station, then from there proceed to Senegambia, because that time we had our soldiers deployed in Senegambia, the TSU, Tourism Security Unit, then pass there and then finally go to Kairaba Avenue and then go to Fajara Barracks. So on this occasion also, um, on this particular day also, as usual, in that late evening, I was going round, you know, then I went uh, up to around, when I finished that area, I went up to just finishing the Latikunda market, going towards Tabokoto to check our last fighting position on the boundary with Yundum. I received a call from our adjutant. Uh, the adjutant is uh, Lieutenant Yahya Jame. He was our adjutant. Then I received call from him. Uh, he said, uh, permission, sir. I said, uh, Caron, are you, uh, who is that adjutant? I said, how are you? He said, fine. He said, sir, where are you? I said, as usual, I'm, I'm going around to look after the problems of our troops. Um, but right now, I'm just going to our last uh, point, uh, the GMPC uh, uh, petrol station in Abuko. Then from there, I will turn uh, back to the Petroleum House, TSU, Senegambia, and back to Bakau. He said, uh, but the commander said he has been calling you, but he cannot get you, the commanding officer. That is Colonel Tamba Jesus. I said, he is calling me, he cannot get me. I said, no. I said, my telephone is on. Maybe it's the network, but I have not received any call from him. I said, please tell him, let him try me. He said, okay. So after a while, um, as I was driving up to around Tabokoto to pass the petrol station to go, again, my phone rang again for a second time. He said, uh, he said, sir, but commander said he is still calling you. He cannot get you. I said, it's strange. Maybe the network. He said, okay, commander said you come back to the camp. He said there is an information from Banjul uh, to brief all the troops. I said, okay. So at that uh, uh, place, uh, without reaching GMPC Abuko, I just took a U-turn uh, back to come back to Bakao. So I came, you know, that, ti that time the traffic was, was free. You know, th there is less traffic. I came through Kairaba Avenue. Then I came, um, when I was passing the Kairaba station, our guys were stationed there. I saw that, you know, then the state guard had also deployed there uh, an anti-aircraft gun. And I saw those, uh, those sandbags were torn. I advised them. I said, these sandbags that are torn, remove them, empty the sand, and just rearrange the sandbags. So then, then after that, I boarded the vehicle and I went back to Fajara Barracks. When I arrived at Fajara Barracks, my commanding officer was not there. Um, incidentally, also, that was the day that the African Cup of Nations started, either the first or the second day. So I just entered my office with my Otley. You know, uh, there was football, and you know, the tension was high in the camp. I said, ah, let me go to the um, drivers, their office, to watch the match there. They were showing the match there. So from there, I went there, and I was sitting there watching the match. Uh, barely 20 minutes after that, the Otley of the commander came looking for me. 
So um, I think somebody told him I am there with the drivers watching. He came and saluted me. He said, Commander, say you go. I said, okay. So I just got up like that. That time, everybody, wherever you are going, you are carrying your helmet, your weapon, and your weapon is always on you. Stand by is like that. Wherever you are going, you are carrying along your weapon. Every soldier was carrying, every soldier who was armed that time was carrying the weapon. So then, then I, I, I followed the orderly. And uh, uh, when I followed the orderly, we take a turn around the armory. Then I saw my commanding officer, and he was coming towards me. So you know he was smoking and talking on the telephone. So when we get closer, before we meet, he switch off the telephone. He, he, he ring off the call, and you know something strange happened. I expect that I should salute him, but instead he salute me before I salute him. You know, in the military, we we say some uh, we say something uh, very common. Uh, the reason why they say the soldier is always six common sense as opposed to five. You have to have the ability to distinguish what is usual from what is unusual. That was very unusual. I expect that I should salute him, but he saluted me before I salute him. So I was saying, I was smelling some, some things, you know. So he said to me, yes, uh, he said to me, I, I call you back. Um, we have an information from Banjul, so let us gather the whole battalion, and then we brief them. I said, okay. I asked for the RSM. They said the RSM is away. His deputy, I asked him to fall in the whole battalion. So then they, they started falling in the battalion until uh, when the RSM was just about to hand over to me, I invite the officers, then when the commanding officer come, I also hand over, then we listen to the information. Then he came out from his office and called me again. So I went and I met with him halfway. He said to me, um, now uh, let the soldiers wait. Uh, first, there are two information, one for the officers only, the order for everybody. So let the officers have briefing in my office force. Let's have briefing in my office. Then after that, then we will, we will all go together and brief the rest of the men. So I told the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the deputy RSM, I told him that, you know, it's already dark. It was almost around after Maghrib. I said, please don't allow the soldiers to scatter because it will take time to gather them again. Let them just scatter but stay within then after the meeting, we will come and meet them. So when I went, uh, I met the adjutant at the gate. He said that, uh, sir, but commander said, you know, the, he said the tension is high. So let us have a meeting. Let us place our weapons and have a meeting without weapons because the situation tension is very high. But we are in our camp. So I said, okay. So the officers who were coming, I said, ah, um, uh, my commander said he said he doesn't want us to have meeting, you know, um, with our weapons. Let's place our weapons and then come to his office to have meeting. Some officers were reluctant, but me being the second in command, I persuaded them. I said, "Look, this is our home, man. We are having meeting in our home. Our gate is guarded. We have over almost eight to nine hundred troops here. What can happen? Nothing. Let's just place our weapons." So. They went to the ante room to place their weapons. I turned, my orderly was walking behind me. He's also armed, he walking, you know, some few steps behind me. I removed my helmet, I gave him. I removed my weapon, I gave him. I removed my rifle and I gave him. I said, go and sit in the office and wait. The moment we come out from the office, then bring my things. When he was even going, I forgot my, my pistol was with me, so I just pulled out the pistol. I said, come, come, come. Then finally, I gave him the pistol, and he went, he went to the office. Then we went inside. We were having about 14 officers at the Fajara barracks. So I ushered them into the office of the commander. We all sat. And then I, I said to him, sir, we have 14 personnel. Um, let's pray and start the meeting. I don't even know the agenda, what the agenda of the meeting was. So while that was going on, I heard the noise of vehicles roaring outside around the commander's office. 
And when I listened keenly to the sound of the engines, I knew that these are not the vehicles of our, our th these are not our vehicles, they are not the Fajara Barracks vehicle. I am familiar, you know, to the, the convoy vehicles, they are, they are the sound of their engine, the state guard vehicles, then the sound of their engine. So, and suddenly it appeared to me as if some people were jumping out of the vehicle. It was already dark. So whilst we were praying to start the meeting, suddenly, you know, two guys came, pop, they opened the door. The officers were sitting inside. Um, I don't remember the rest, but the one who came to tell the commander, we come to you, come, is um, one Lieutenant Noah Williams. So um, then the commander said, who, me? When they, the way they pushed the door, everybody was somehow reactive. But I was sitting directly facing my commander, but he didn't have such reaction. It's normal to have such reactions. If he doesn't have that su such reaction, it means maybe he knew the subject matter. So then he came out with them. Less than two minutes, he came back alone and tell me, uh, bro, answer to these people. I said, me? He said, yes. I said, what for? He said, no answer. So as I was coming out, you know, it's like, uh, this is the door. One of them had taken cover here. Another one had taken cover here. The moment I step out, they grab my hand and then, you know, put the handcuff. You know, and I was uh, struggling with them until eventually they were able to handcuff me. When they want to push me inside, I stamped the wall with you know, some struggle with them. Then again, I think when he went inside again, he told uh, Captain Demba Balden Barodi. Um, Barodi also, he, he, he also they, they also entered inside and then they handcuffed Barodi also. So what happened is they drove the car up to the gate, up to the door of the, com and they, they opened the car and then just uh, pushed us inside. Uh, I was expecting that definitely the fighting would have started that, that moment because I never thought that a, a twice of a battalion, battalion which is roughly around almost 900 to 1,000 soldiers, that a foreign, a foreign element of roughly around 25 people or less than that will come to the camp and arrest the deputy commander of the camp and get out of the camp without a firefight. If that happens, that it means it means there was a setup. You mentioned that there were foreign elements. Which security force were they from? The, they were from the state guards. They were from the state guards, um, from military police personnel from the state guard, head, headed by Lieutenant Noah William. So like I said, for my commander to be arrested in the Fajara barracks, then it means then before they, before they take him, I should have been dead before they take him. And before I die, I expect that my troops should die before I die. So obviously, if it happens, then logically, you know that there is a set up. While in the car, you know, in the car, arrested in the car, two of us, you know, the vehicles I was go going, I was just listening to hear a shot because I expect that there must be a fight because they will not let me go. But that how the vehicle, how the vehicle went up to the gate, I was still expecting a fight from my troops. And the vehicle just exited the gate and turned towards the fire service, you know, and then they, they keep on dropping us in the night. And then they, they cover our faces. So we drove for a while, for a while. Then eventually we came to a place and then they, I, I hear the sound of opening a door, it's like a big door opening. And in my mind, I was not seeing, but I was calculating that the whether it's east, west, or they are going finally. I knew that we are somewhere in Banjul and that was at the, the NIA headquarters. So they dropped us there, they took our things, you know, they took our jujus, you know, 
Um, one is that they, they had already taken out cell phones. And <coughs> then after that, uh, the, the handcuff was, and then, you know, lock was in different, in different cells. From, from that moment, I didn't see Captain Barodi again. I was, I was handcuffed and I was locked up in a, in a cell, in an under, 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 underground cell. Where even I cannot, I cannot even see nothing, you know. It was as dark as, you know, probably forest in the night, middle of the night. Do you know if um, that underground cell is known by any name? Uh, well, actually, I, I don't know. I, I know that they, they, they are cells they call Bambadinka, but definitely I, I didn't know the name, you know, be, because I have not been, apart from that, our 2012 incident, I have not, I've not been to NIA. You know, I've not been there, really. I've never, I've never been there. 2012 was the first time that we, were, we, we went there. And, you know, if you are not by yourself, of course, it's only the area do, that you are taking that you can know, you know. I think we're running a bit out of time. Um, you said they took you to the NIA and you were in an underground cell. Can you tell us what happened after that? Did you stay there? Uh, I was there, I think, until around 3 a.m. in the night. You know, again, I had the vehicle enter. Then suddenly I had the way, I, you know, the, my cell is a steel door, this carbonated steel door. You know, so I had the, you know, there are padlocks and then crack, crack, they are opening. So when I, when I, when they open, uh, I was handcuffed. This time they removed the handcuff and then they handcuffed my hands behind. And then they, they hooded me again and then they put me into a car. Uh, they drove, drove me uh, until, you know, I know they passed the Denton Bridge. You know, cough, 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 you know. Then eventually, again, you know, another, I had another door open again, you know. Uh, this later I knew because uh, it was a, a, a special uh, detention center behind the, behind the Joshua prison. Behind the Joshua prison. It was a private home but it is, is converted to a detention center where they have to, you know, modify the rooms, you know, make them smaller. And then, you know, they, there's this ring, ring rot. They concrete it on the wall. Uh, when they are handcuffing you, they put the handcuff here, hand, put the handcuff and handcuff you there in that, in that ring handle. So um, around that 3 a.m., they took me there. So they, 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 put me in the cell, then they remove the hood and then they handcuff me like uh, <laughs> the way you tied your cow in the, in the, in the a stubborn cow in the, in the, in the, in the, in the cartoon. So um, I was there. Uh, suddenly I, I also hear somebody coughing. But there are a lot of those, they, they, it is divided into different cells. So not knowing that uh, there were some other colleagues of mine uh, who were also locked in different cells there, uh, namely um, Lieutenant Colonel C. D. Juv. <coughs> he was he is in Yundum now, and Major Yusfa Jame, Major Yusfa Jame also. These are people we were all instructors at the school together. We work at the school together and as instructors for sh for so many years. You know, so um, Major Yusfa Jame was also also locked in the other cell. CD was also locked in the orders. But I never know. I just had someone coughing. I was wondering who would be these guys. <coughs> so the day I was arrested, then I did the, I didn't I didn't eat dinner. <coughs> I didn't drink. The following day I didn't eat. I think the, the next day in the in the morning. And then they, they brought um some some loose bread and, and, and butter. You know, I was suspicious. That is that is our that is our that is our way. That is our upbringing. You know, we, we you should always be suspicious. You know, that's the way my tribe. That's how we think. We should always be suspicious. So when they br they, they brought they removed my handcuff and then they gave me the bread. I was checking inside because we have heard about so many stories. You know, I was thinking probably uh, has the bread been poisoned to eat it and die probably. 
So I opened the bread, and I said, I saw it was a loose, completely loose bread. Maybe a stale bread. It's not a new bread. It's an old bread. So I check. I open and check inside. Then I, I recited Fatiha, and I also recited Yasin. Then you know, and and, and, and I, 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 my mouth was completely dry. When I cut the bread with my teeth, for 15 minutes I was chewing the bread because there was no water in my mouth. You know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't homogen homogenize the bread in my mouth. And eventually um, I, I decided to swallow it. And, and when I swallowed it, my, my, my stomach was almost tearing. My stomach was like, you know, you are punching my stomach inside with, with knives. And then I started sweating, you know, the whole of my body, even my palms and uh, under my, my feet were all sweating. You know, and uh, eating the bread, is, it was like I'm eating the raw sun. You know, so um, that's where we stayed uh, until I think on the 19th evening or 20. <coughs> A night, the director of NIA Yanku Babaji came there. And they opened the cell, cell. When they opened the cell, he saw me. So he called me, said, Maube. Then I started crying. Uh, because uh, I, uh, I knew him because when the, when the, when the uh, security chiefs visited the camp two times on the sideline, uh, I said to him, I said, uh, then, I said, I am the one who is doing the ballistic examination. Uh, for the arms and security service. He said, oh, you are Captain Ba. I said, yes. I said, but sir, I have so many problems. Because, you know, weapon, you cannot give it to somebody who doesn't know it to carry it or if it is explosive or grenade. I said, I need to have a vehicle to be able to do my job. You know, arms and ammunition are control items. You don't just give it to anyone to carry it. I said, I have that problem in, you know, getting a vehicle to be able to move to transport this thing. He promised me personally that he was going to give me a car from the NIA. Personally, he said, come, I will give you a car. So when he saw me, you know, then he, I was crying, and then he came and, and hold me. He said, look, don't cry, you know, full and jola, you know, we are, we are cal. You know, I was, I don't know, for some reason, I couldn't control my emotions. I was, I was just crying, you know. You know, I, I said to him, with all the effort I have, I have done, this is, this is what I deserve. He said, okay, don't worry, we, we have done our findings. I don't know, because we are already locked, we don't know the news outside. On the whole, all those negotiations have taken place until, you know, this guy was, was about going. He said, no, you know, we have investigated, you know, but then you people are clean, so it's late today, but tomorrow morning, um, we'll come and pick you and then take you to the NI headquarters. So we spent that night, that day. The following day, I think in the afternoon, <coughs> they came to pick us from there and then they, they converge us. Then at the, at the NI headquarters, when they converge us there, I saw so many other of my colleagues. I was thinking that it was only me and Captain Barodi on the whole yeah, we are so many other of our colleagues, I think around 14 of us who um, were also uh, arrested. So we, we, we took our things and then Yankuba sat us, you know, he's telling, yes, you know, this, sometimes it happened like this. Even myself, I was one time locked for no reason, crib, carab, you know, so many things. You know, he spoke nicely, he said, okay, but then, you know, no problems, you know, nothing is found against you. And you didn't even tell us for what reason were we arrested and you are saying nothing was found about us. So um, then <coughs> uh, we, we, we live in different areas. They, they ask us where do you live, you know, so people live in different places. I said to them, <coughs> I live in, um, I said I live in Latakunda. In actual fact, I don't live in Latakunda. But not knowing the situation that time, I didn't want anyone who was supposed to drop me with a car to know my home. So when they brought me with a car up to Latrikunda, I said, um, you can drop me here. My home is just very close. Let's take you home. He said, I said, no, it's just stone throw, you know. So just drop me here. 
So they dropped me there. Actually, I live in Sukuda. Then I took a taxi there, and I went to my home. I just have a couple of quick questions for you. You mentioned that um, you were released on the 19th or 20th. Do you remember of which month and which year? It was January. I think January 20. January 20. Of which year? Uh, 2017. And, and do you recall how long you spent um, at the detention center? Uh, we spent a week. A week or a little more than a week. Roughly a week or a little more than a week. <laughs> and when you came out, do you recall where the president, Yaya Jame, was at the time? Um, uh, uh, eventually, uh, when I came out, you know, because I didn't know the situation, so I just went to my home, but I didn't spend the night at my home. I went to Yuna. One of my brother lives in Yuna, Abdullah, you know, and then we were told that, the, you know, uh, the Yaya Jame left the, the night before, the last night. You said that you weren't informed of why you were arrested or what you were being investigated for, but what do you believe is the reason why you were arrested? Uh, until today, nobody in the entire armed forces ever told me or from the NIA ever told me why I was arrested. Uh, however, when I was arrested, uh, this is my brother Osman, he went to the Foroya and published the story about my arrest. Uh, when they released me, I said, Osman, let's go to the Foroya so that I can thank them. Because it was not any newspaper that was bold enough to publish about these type of things. But I want to go to Foroya and thank them. So when uh, the former CDS Osman Baji saw that story, he called me and then he asked me, uh, Captain Bai, you who asked you to go to Foroya and uh, this, that, that, that. I insulted him. I insulted his mother. I said, if you are a man, come face to face and ask me. I said I was arrested, you know, with all what happened to me. You are the chief of defense staff. You didn't even call me, even if you don't know what happened, why I was arrested. You didn't even call to console me, to ask me sorry for what has happened, you know, this, that, that. You are calling me and, and asking me foolish questions. I said, if you are a man, come and ask me why I went to the foreigner to go and uh, publish about my, my issue there. And until today, he never asked me. Never asked me. When I saw we greet, we talk casually, finish. Until he was, uh, until he was um, finally um, retired from the army, armed forces. Did you at any point carry out the instructions or start carrying out the instructions he gave you in relation to the explosives? I have never, I have never intended. Um, I was looking at him as a foolish man and I was calculating that, look, I am a citizen of this country. These nice people of the Gambia, everybody is saying that. If I had attempted to do this, I'm calculating, don't you think God will confuse me and I will make mistakes and prematurely I myself may explode there with, with the other guys and that would be the end of the story. And I said, I will never do that. Even if they have given me, counted billion dollars and give me, I would have never done that. I am a professional man. I consider myself as a professional and I will not use the knowledge and skill I have for any bad reason whatsoever. If it is in the defense of the country, I will do it. But if it is just out of what, I can't uh, do that because in the military, uh, we are to obey orders and follow instructions, but the instructions and the orders have to be, have to be legal. They have to be legal instructions. They have to be legal orders. And if they are legal, that is part of discipline you are expected to, to follow. Follow the command. The last question from me, Captain Ba, is considering the experience that you've narrated here, 
first of all, as someone who has committed um, some human rights violations, and as someone who has suffered human rights violations, can you just tell us lastly what impact this entire experience has had on you? Uh, whatever you live through, you know, uh, it builds you either positively or negatively. Over these years, what has happened uh, has built me, and I feel it has built me positively. I have gained experience. I have the matured better with the trainings I had, the professional training, the academic training. You know, um, so many things have happened and I am still here. I want to thank God for that. Uh, I have uh, committed some mistakes and I have also been a victim. I think these are lessons that uh, will be indelible in, in me till the end of my life. Um, the TRRC, I'm not saying anything to ingratiate you. I think this is a good job. And I think anybody also who has done something wrong uh, should be bold enough to come and tell the truth. In Salah, there are a lot of things that are going. We have the security sector reform. Uh, inshallah, I hope it will be done in a, in a very good way, in a correct way. And the soldiers will be, will be trained um, because um, for the past 22 years, uh, the soldiers have not been training. They have been, uh, they have been radicalized. They were not training. Believe me, those weapons that we had in the army, less than 15% were, were able to operate them. And around that time, you know, when you don't know the secret of things, you don't know. Even a, an organized rebel group could have just come and then defeated us. Because the materials we were having, we, 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 don't, know, we don't know them. Our fighting elements don't know how to use them. So the army was highly politicized. And I think uh, the armed forces and the entire security services of the Gambia should be disconnected with politics. They should concentrate on their jobs. They should be professionalized. And we should see ourselves as the military. We are the first assets of the country, accept it or not. Our primary function is to defend the territorial integrity of the country, to protect the citizens and the properties of the Gambia, and to protect everyone who is resident in the Gambia. This is the responsibility of the army. We are the institution uh, on whose foundation development is, is built upon. And if your foundation is not good, then you don't expect a good structure. So this is what I want to say. I have said so many things. Um, when you talk, there is tendency to make mistake. If I say anything good and anything truthful, it's God who inspired me to say that. If there is any mistake, it is my own human uh, shortcomings. So I want to um, beg for forgiveness if I had made a mistake. I thank you for your time, Captain Ba. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's the end of the testimony. Unless the commissioners have any further questions, that is it for this witness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma Council, and uh, thank you, Captain Ba, for your testimony. I hope um, uh, the confessions that you made about torturing OJ would help him uh, promote healing and reconciliation not just between you and OJ, but perhaps uh, uh, the country and the process that uh, we are embarked on. I have a, a short question to ask you on that. Uh, what kind of instructions do um, the soldiers I mean, the Gambia Armed Forces get regarding respecting international or humanitarian law? Do you... Uh, provide these instructions in either SOPs or in guidelines that they are given or what? There must be, I, I would assume, uh, aware of um, uh, 
telling soldiers how they should respect humanitarian law, including uh, um, the prohibition of torture. Um, I'm not aware of any SOB. If there is any also, I'm not aware. <laughs> but um, usually um, our peacekeeping troops, uh, before they are deployed to Darfur or wherever, usually they, they do a lot of trainings, including training on international humanitarian law. And uh, at the Armed Forces Training School also, there is an also an element on that, on the law of war, uh, who to engage uh, in case there is a battle, how to treat the enemy when you capture the enemy. And I remember this famous uh, British SOP where one time I was involved in PSO, PSO training, uh, uh, peace, peace support operation training. And those uh, instructors, uh, the British Army instructors from Gibraltar in our practicals, uh, they said that when you, the enemy attacks you and fire at you, he misses you, and he is running away, he's retreating, even though you are um, you are not expected to fire him because already he is retreating, re retreating. And I think Islam also is the same thing. In Islam, is also the same thing. All uh, those good laws are, are normally in line in line with Islam. So where somebody has engaged you and he is retreating, you are not supposed to fire him. Even if you arrest him, then wh what should you do to him? You should treat him according to the rules of the Geneva Convention. Ask his name, ask his rank as an officer, and comfort him. So um, I think uh, there should be more of that training. Uh, the officers already, they know. But uh, probably we need to filter these things to the troops as well. Because the bulk of the army, the bulk of the fighting force of the army also are the troops. So unless the troops are good, then we officers are not good. If, if we, if I always tell my officers at the Fajara Barras, I said if we sit here, we feel that we are professional, we are good, and our troops are not good. It means then we are not good because if we are good, then we should make our we should make our troops also to be to be professional and to be good. So I'm so um, the new CDS um, General Kinte, he, he have a great vision for the army. He have a great vision to professionalize the army. Uh, I have worked with him closely uh, from the training school years back, and even before he was removed the last time. We have got good plans for the army to professionalize the army. What I will urge myself and urge my fellow officers if to, is to give him 100% helping hands. He is, he is, he is very professional. He is, he, is, he, is a, he is a visionary leader. He is good. If he is given the opportunity, uh, definitely he will, he will transform the armed forces. Thank you for that answer. I do hope that uh, instructions are given. At the time of um, a training, you said um, you're an instructor at the, or you were, at the training um, school, that uh, young soldiers, people joining the armed forces, are trained to respect um, these laws. Even in uh, established um, uh, uh, armies or military establishments, these are things that are updated, they are taken care of, they are given as instructions. In the late, um, I think it was early 90s, I spent a month or two lecturing at um, uh, Sandhurst, and we were working exactly on these rules of um, uh, war, rules um, uh, that need to be uh, updated from time to time. If Sandhurst is doing that, um, I can't imagine that uh, in a situation like this with a, uh, an instruction school here in the Gambia, that uh, that is not, uh, soldiers are not um, uh, taught to handle um, uh, that. But I do hope um, uh, that your colleagues are listening to you and at some point uh, people are trained to respect these laws and avoid uh, torturing other people. The second question I have deals with uh, 
think you probably answered that. Maybe it's more clarification. When you were given instructions to, or suggestions or whatever it was, to uh, plant explosives, did you have um, uh, explosives already somewhere stored or you were to uh, manufacture uh, explosives? I just wanted to be sure that uh, if you did have them, where were they stored and did you have enough um, to hit the targets that were being suggested to you? Um, uh, yes, we, we have explosives in Yundum barracks. And then also I was privileged after when the new government came in, I was privileged to go and disarm Kanilai. I was privileged, escorted by the economic. And there I also discovered so many explosives there. And in Banjula, the state house also, there are explosives. You know, when you say explosive, is a general term. Not only the, the, the conventional explosive stuff, but even a grenade. You can enhance it and then, you know, increase the impact. Um, explosives were not readily uh, with me. If I was willing, I could have improvised because I have conducted some, uh, some um, the demolition exercise here in 2006 when we had that uh, container of scrap metals that came from Guinea-Bissau and they, put, they mistakenly put along, along some cells there and it exploded. I was the one who disposed those ones off. I could have improvised. But, you know, they were readily available. And uh, considering the influence of the man, if I call him, uh, probably I said I need uh, uh, five kilograms of C4 or TNT. You know, uh, they could have provided anyway. They could have provided, really. Uh, it was not, the explosives were not av available with me. They were available in the, in the army stores. And considering uh, the guy who gave me the instructions, considering, considering the influence he has got, if I had agreed and probably called him a day or two after I said, um, okay, I have did my mat mathematical calculation and I just need five uh, kilograms of C4 um, or TNT. These are type of explo uh, type names of explosives. Uh, C4 is composition for... Uh, TNT is the train trotula something like that. Um, so he would have made it available, but I was not interested whatsoever to do harm because already I have had the experience, so I didn't want to, to mess up any longer. This is why I didn't call him, and I also I didn't respond to him. Uh, I agree with what you said, uh, like about this training on international humanitarian law and the law, the law, law of armed conflict and law of war. I concur fully with, with what you have said, sir. Thank you very much. Any uh, commissioners have any? Commissioner Carr, Commissioner Jones, Commissioner Kinte, and uh, Commissioner C later on. Yeah, let's go in that order. Commissioner Carr, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of questions I want to ask. The first is you said um, uh, General Baji told you that the coalition wanted to revenge. Did, you, did he tell you what revenge? That's my first question. The second is you also said that you are moved away from the NIA to another illegal detention center. Do you know about the existence of other illegal detention centers? Uh, can you repeat the first question, please? Sorry. Yes, from my understanding of what you said um, during your meeting with General Baji, uh, uh, he told you that the coalition, oh, uh, some people wanted to revenge. Um, do you know or did he tell you what revenge that was? Um, uh, no, I think uh, pa partially I have already answered that question because when he made these allegations, you know, I, I assume that, you know, he is making the allegations against, uh, against the coalition because they were the only people who were legally contesting what they own that time. So when he made the inference that uh, these people want to revenge, although he didn't specify, I assume that he was referring to the coalition because the coalition was the only body that was contesting the power in the Gambia, and they were they, they were only the, the, the only body that was legally to contest 
the power and authority of uh, in the Gambia at that time. So I assume that he was referring to the coalition, but what uh, revenge, what vengeance, he didn't specify. Uh, sorry, um, can you repeat the second one as well? Yes, um, you mentioned that you are moved, from my own understanding again, from the NIA to okay, another okay. illegal detention. Okay, so okay. Do you know about the existence of other illegal? Uh, well, um, uh, before I was uh, taken to the NIA, I thought perhaps NIA was the only detention center. That's what I thought. But when I was, uh, I find myself suddenly at a, at a place around Joshua Prison, I was surprised, definitely. Um, when I asked my other colleagues, and they also told me they were detained around the petroleum house, around that area, or that's where I detained, I don't know, somewhere. Yeah, and later it emerged, even at the airport, you have some secret detention centers at the airport. You know, I was shocked and definitely surprised. And for the fact that, you know, uh, I found myself kept in that detention center. So again, I assume that, I assume that there would be similar, similar detention centers. And information arrived that, you know, there are so many uh, detention centers, secret detention centers as well. Thank you. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones. Um, Captain, but within the commission, we have um, several committees, one of which is the Child Protection Committee. You did mention that in 2012, when you were at, um, the, uh, at um, the NIA, some children were brought in for questioning. Did you get to see or do you remember um, who those people were who brought in the children? Two, please don't mention the names. Did you eventually get to find out who those children were and do you know if they were tortured at all? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, well, the fact that the children were brought uh, to the NIA and I was, I was, I was uh, behind, behind bars there, and it was night around one o'clock, imagine, even, even if the lights are on, you know, at a distance, I was not able to recognize. And so many years have, uh, some few years have passed, the children have grown up also. So I may not um, be able to remember uh, what the children are, who the children were. But uh, my understanding is that uh, they were not they were not tortured. Uh, my understanding is that they were uh, just asked, and then they reacted the movie there. They reacted the movie, and I think after that they let them go. Thank you, Commissioner Kinte. Um, Captain Ba, this is Comms Commissioner Kinte. <coughs> I remember you said uh, um, the army was seriously politicized. In some technical term, one would say it was highly polluted. Um, do you have any suggestions in the reform of the army that will you know, reduce the politicization or the, the pollution so that not what is coming next, already what the, what the situation is? I have, do you have any recommendations that you can make that will improve the state and professionalism, competency, and reliability of the army. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Kite. <coughs> I think to depoliticize the army, that will be the job of the, 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 the government. And also um, in conjunction with the authorities of the Gambia Armed Forces. Uh, the soldiers are there to obey orders and follow instructions. So it is the duty of the authorities to make sure that they, they disconnect the army with, with, uh, with politics. Um, let them allow the army to concentrate on their constitutional role. Once they allow the army to uh, concentrate on their constitutional role and the authorities give the high command of the Gambia Armed Forces the leeway, the absolute freedom to you know, make sure that you know the army is not politicized, is professionalized. I think um, the guys at the helm of affairs in the Gambia Armed Forces, with their concerted effort, uh, they can do that. Uh, I know that there is a security sector reform; it should be actualized as well. Um, thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, uh, Commissioner C. Imam C. Abu Bakar ba Commissioner Imam C. We thank you for the apology you have rendered to Oje Jallo. What you have done is uh, in line with Islam. Commissioner has had your statement and your apology. Secondly, when you were arrested for the second time, were you tortured? Uh, physically, no. But uh, psychologically and, and others, uh, yes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Captain Kinte, um, Captain Ba. Um, uh, Council, we don't have any further uh, questions um, from your side. Uh, we will um, uh, end um, our session for the morning and they come back in an hour's time after lunch. Do we have um, uh, the next witness ready or? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. If, uh, if the commission so directs, uh, we would oblige without question. Very wise, um, uh, Council. You put the ball back in my court after our discussion before in the area. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock. Meeting is adjourned. Much obliged. <laughs>